architecture is really the art and science of turning fiction into fact. Sometimes uh, kind of real architectural life interferes with intellectual architectural life. There is no such thing as architecture. Hello everyone, this is Vikram Prakash recording from yet another week of quarantine and you are listening to Architecture Talk, hopefully sheltering safely in place wherever you are. We continue our series thinking about architecture in the time of coronavirus and today I'm talking to Michael Murphy, the founding director of Mass Design Group a uh, mass design collective, really, rather, uh, who is just about probably the very best person to talk about the role of architecture in an epidemic, in a pandemic, because Michael has been working with mass in the Congo, in Latin America, in many other parts of the world, following doctors and assisting them in building structures that are supportive of epidemics, pandemics, and other medical necessities. So I ask him, what are the lessons that he has drawn and what can he tell us about architecture and the coronavirus? I hope you enjoy. Here we go. Hi, Michael. Welcome to Architecture Talk. I'm so glad you've taken the time to have this conversation with us. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here. You are the seem to be the man for the job and your firm, Mass Design, uh, seems to be the architectural office perfectly positioned to talk to and respond to the current epidemic we find ourselves in. And I know... You know, you have published a series of op-eds and you have at least some drawings and outlines about how to set up pop-up clinics on your website. And this seems to be, you know, and you are citing the work that you have done in Africa, sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but in other parts of the world, Haiti and so on, dealing with epidemics of various kinds, uh, working first with the Dr. Paul Farmer and others. So seems like uh, if anybody can say what architecture can do in the current crisis, it would be you. So I'm excited <laughs> to talk to you about uh, this. Yeah. But let me start some. Let me start somewhere else. How how, how are you doing uh, yourself at home uh, with the I presume stay at home orders uh, up there in Poughkeepsie as well? Uh, how how have you how are you adapting and how have you adapted your home to be more, uh, let's say, uh, healthy yeah. uh, from your design principles? No, thanks for asking. Yeah, I mean, I hope, I hope you are also uh, faring well and are healthy, um, staying safe and isolated. I uh, am, I am. We've, um, my wife and I uh, have, have moved in like many others with, her in, with my in-laws uh, up in um, uh, Freeport, Maine, actually. Oh, a, okay. A little bit of space uh, from Boston. And uh, and so in that situation, uh, decently, you know, we're doing well. And we have a new child. Um, uh, we welcomed our first uh, son. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, 12 weeks Twelve weeks ago. So, you know, like many, uh, like so many of us, you know, managing child care is a big question of, of how we, of the isolation. And so having some additional hands has been really, really helpful. And a wonderful kind of respite from from the the busy life that so many of us have in the architectural community of traveling uh, all, all the time to projects and to new engagements uh you know uh, cutting down travel right. and being isolated at home uh or at, at my in-laws house has been a radical shift from my normal schedule of uh the last 12 years um, so, you know, faring, you know, f- right now, healthy and, and safe. And, um, you know, I certainly uh, am appreciative of the opportunity we have to get additional hands on child care. And, you know, your second question about how we're making that a house a little bit uh, healthier is, is definitely something we've been we've been talking about. I mean, part of part of it is 
how do we protect our our family and uh, you know our uh, my my wife's parents obviously are uh, in the age range of of more susceptible to the disease right, and, uh, right. So yep. we've been trying to keep them isolated and also protect ourselves so that we're not co-infecting them and then we've been putting in air filtration and uh, air movement in in the in the in the house and putting the fans on and you know kind of getting some air movement in in the house and, and doing a lot of uh, kind of recommended strategies for protecting food and other things as we bring into the house so trying to are mock. you keeping the windows and doors open as much as you can are as you much providing as we can, yeah as much as we can yeah um, okay and you know one of the things we weren't sure about uh, in the early days of covid uh early days you know three weeks ago is how much of it was actually aerosolized um, but uh, you know we are we are recognizing that more and more of i think new studies are showing that aerosolization is part of the contagious pathway of of the disease and you know so the movement of air turns out to be really quite crucial to uh to managing or coping with or reducing infections of, of covid uh, so air mixing right. air movement cross ventilation all these things are are going to turn out to be it seems more and more essential to our to our, our strategy for for infection control yeah you emphasize uh dealing with the air surfaces and and water uh, as the key places that uh, you know design can be effective in the containment of uh, of the virus uh, in particular i suppose in the design of uh, clinics uh, but but talk but let's just stay with this topic of you know since everybody is in isolation you know the media isn't really talking much about besides six feet in public you know how you should be thinking about your own home or or ventilation or or other issues in terms of the design of your own space or your immediate neighborhood i suppose i mean do you have other tips to uh share with us yeah well i mean i you know it, it is true i mean there's one of these challenging situations is suddenly every space has become a medical space right um, this kind of paradigm shift we're undergoing where where each one of us is now intimately aware of the potential threat of the built environment around us. That right. I think is a radical moment that we're undergoing as a, as a, as a society and one that has, you know, potential uh, significant risks and threats uh, in terms of maybe increased surveillance or increased you know, digital access to information, but also, possible uh, new optimistic futures about the way in which we demand more of our built world to uh, to perform at a higher caliber and protect us more effectively, not just from, you know, uh, snow and rain, but uh, actually mm -hmm. protect us from the elements and from the kind of contagious diseases that are around us. This kind of healthy building idea is suddenly in everybody's front of everybody's mind. You know, so to your question, like, what else can we do? Uh, you know, I think, I think the idea of repurposing spaces that weren't designed to manage infection is uh, is something that we we can actively do. We can increase aerosolization, uh, sort of airflow. Um, you know, the WHO recommends twelve air changes per hour mm -hmm. uh, to reduce infection, at least of tuberculosis. Uh, and so I think rules of thumb like like that could could help us uh, think about our domestic spaces, our restaurants, commercial spaces. I think the other thing is just to is to learn like what are those spaces that are most potentially contagious and have a like an increase of our own spatial literacy of what the spaces around us are are not protected and. With that kind of increase in spatial literacy or that visibility that we might have that, oh, well, that's a space without a window. That's an enclosed room with people in it and there's no air movement. There's, mm -hmm. there's lots of surfaces you have to touch to get into it. Those are potentially more contaminated spaces uh, that we can try to avoid, like hallways, like you know, lobbies that are uh, sealed off without airflow, um, you know, some public areas that you can't trust fully, that you can't trust have been you know, protected or decontaminated. Elevators. Uh, elevators, yeah. I, I think that's exactly right. And, you know, I think this kind of mix of uh, simple rules of thumb to both improve the 
let's say, air movement in a space. We're all coping with surface surface awareness. So I think obviously cleaning and, and being protected against surfaces is obviously the second one. Uh, but the third is just visibility. I think it's designing for trust, a kind of visibility or visual cues, spatial cues that remind us that spaces around us could be contaminating us and we can try to adju- you know, adjust towards them and protect ourselves and, and the community around us. So, you know, in infection control principles, uh, you know, we, we often talk about three scales of infection control. There's the personal infection control strategy. That's, of course, PPE, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can put a mask on. There's the environmental. I would say that's the building itself, how how you might have negative pressure in a room or airflow in a room. And then there's the kind of institutional where, you know, people are control, you know, institutions are controlling how many people come in or h- how people are separated or, or or the flow of a larger group of of people are all kind of strategies that we can use. And I think right now we're only in the PPE. We're only in the personal protective zone because we're not aware of how the environmental controls around us are are being uh, are being used or optimized and i think we will slowly move into that space where we can trust more and more the public realm uh, that's being controlled under certain rules that we agree are working uh, and that allows us to kind of open up a little bit more you know, when I think back at the, uh, well, it's not equivalent, but when I think back at the 9-11 in 2001 and kind of the massive transformation of, uh, well, at least airports, but the general experience of going through a lot of public spaces that that event brought about. The, from there, you know, extrapolating to the coming future, my question is, I'm hearing in your in your words, and I'm you know, and a lot of us are thinking about this. There is going to be some change in our relationship to thinking about public space, uh, and possibly even some change in in let's say rules and zone zoning and so on and so forth. Uh, the question is, you know. I have an ambiguous relationship with the changes that were brought about after 9-11. Mm-hmm. Do you think, what, what is your thoughts on, in what ways is this sort of a more healthy or more health conscious or visually, uh, you know, health literate uh, relationship to public space? How can that be a progressive things and, and in what ways do you think it might be uh, more, I don't know, dangerous or socially constructive? constraining yeah a good a good question um i too have you know spending so many time so much time in airports uh, to <laughs> feel right. the, you know the burden that we've reconfigured the public realm which was once a very open space uh, of air travel into this basically defensive posture right uh, uh sort of a defensive architecture and you know that's a very reactionary strategy where the built environment was responding to threats in a way that forced everyone to reconfigure the way that they travel or experience air, air flight. I think you'd see a, there's a similar argument you could be made could be made at least in the design of schools in America in response to uh, the gun violence epidemic that we've been yeah you know being well are still right. a part of yeah. you know that, the largest probably the most significant shift in school design has been uh, to protect students against shooters, which is right. you know, hard for other countries to imagine as a reality, but that is an architectural strategy. I mean, if you look at the new, uh, some of the new schools that are being built, they have to be responding to active shooter situations. And I would say something similar in, in healthcare, you know, one of the big innovations in healthcare has been the consolidation of strategies around trauma and trauma being, you know, not just let's say car accidents, but shooters and and traumatic events or or even terrorist events uh, where many people are are killed at once. Trauma centers have been configured, as you know, you know there might be one in every city or, uh, there, but not every hospital is a trauma center, and then they have certain rules and certain protocols, and they have certain flexibilities, and they adapt very quickly to the size of the trauma. Um, and so they've kind of configured both the social, uh, sort of the, the political, financial, and the human capital together to reconfigure 
uh, the sort of daily operations of the hospital to accommodate the kind of surge that we're seeing in traumatic events like, mm-hmm. like shootings. You know, so th- those are all examples of how our systems have changed in response to and reaction to, in this case, you know, very sometimes very American experience of of, of the gun violence epidemic. Right. I, I, I think we've. I think when you look back at history, you'll see that so too the built environment has shifted and sha- been shaped by other epidemics, and mm-hmm. I, I think we should expect the same with with the pandemic of COVID that our built environment, the space around us will, will, will radically shift. And, you know, get to get back to, I think the, the heart of your question, which was, you know, I think one of the, one of the challenging potential threatening things that we'll see is, and are already seeing uh, abroad is an increase of the inevitable surveillance infrastructure, the digital surveillance infrastructure that has now kind of proliferated around our lives and is kind of taking hold. Right, right. Um, while that might keep pe- people healthy, it does introduce all sorts of civil liberty questions. When you right. look at, you know, there's kind of a, as you say, an ambiguous relationship here. When you look at prisons, for example, we're seeing the most radical decarceration uh, happen in prisons, well, mm-hmm. in generations. Yeah. And, you know, so many activists have been arguing for this for years. And to some degree, you might say, well, this is, you know, is one of the, not shining benefits. lights, but benefits of this pandemic is, you know, people are yeah. being moved out of these horrible environments where they don't need to be and they're not a threat to society. I mean, right, and, right, right. and they're being brought home. But what they're also going to experience is what Michelle Alexander calls e-carceration, a kind of digital incarceration where they're surveilled and controlled through other means. So it is something for us to, to kind of keep an eye on. On the inverse, though, where there's an opportunity for maybe a kind of positive outcome, you know, I, I think we, we will see, but I, I, think, I think this paradigm shift of our own, I would even call it a cultural shift of our own understanding of how the built world around us shapes us, shapes our daily lives. That awakening, that awareness um, is happening right now. And it's a moment for us, especially in the architectural and design field, to press hard and ask, you know, how is it helping and hurting? And how can we advance both science, I I would say even spatial disciplines, uh, measurement, as well as the advances in our own kind of the the work that we're doing in schools to say, look, architecture shapes our lives every day. How do we guide it towards and understand the way it's shaping us in really positive ways, shaping our communities, uh, shaping our health, and um, measure that, prove it, show it, advance it, iterate it, test it, and and kind of have that dialogue with the public in a much more direct and um, engaged way. There is this moment that we've all been like, I think, looking for, which is especially around the question of climate change, uh, where the built environment, you know, carbon emissions or 50% of carbon emissions are, are from the built environment, you know, so mm-hmm. we are like at the heart of the question of how a cl- less carbon emissions in our future or a climate positive future. Now is the time where we can really push on that. We can press hard and say, this is the time for a rethinking of our public realm, a rethinking of the materials that we use to actually build a culture of regenerative architecture and fight for that instead of being so reliant on uh, the kind of industries which have driven us in the past. And I right. think that moment is in front of us and is an opportunity for us to really to t- take hold of and I-, I think would align with the cultural shift that we're seeing. We can say not only is there a health of your body, like you can get disease, but there's a health of our community, there's a health of our planet, and all those things are interrelated to keep us healthy. And we can add to that the you know the economic cost you know very clearly demonstrated uh, this time that uh, it's not only the our health and the well being of the environment and our societies but also this contributes to to overall wealth. I mean, is that isn't that right? Absolutely. I mean, access to or the you know a- access to fundamental rights is of course completely hindered by many of these inequities that these systems are advancing but certainly the built environment is one of those systems um, we talk about 
tree coverage in in neighborhoods, you know, keeping people sick. You know, certain lower income neighborhoods don't have as much tree canopy, for example. The uh, adjacency to highways where they've been consuming, you know, emissions for for decades. You know, right. we're seeing now these moments where cities free of cars are suddenly breathing better. And do we can we do things like Milan has done to actually close down those roads and give them back to the public? Mm-hmm. Can we make an argument that restaurants are not safe enough uh, right now, no matter if you're six feet apart or have a you know plexiglass barrier between your, your banquette? Uh, so you have to spill those tables onto the streets and take over the streets. I mean, those discussions, I think, are really exciting ones that are happening now and it should give us some hope. Uh, what about the question of the envelope, the building envelope? Uh, I mean, a lot of sort of sustainable design seems to focus on that and uh, making you know them more airtight uh, and uh, non-porous. Uh, yes. Would you like to see a fundamental shift in that discussion? A hundred percent. I think we've. I think the big shift that we need to see, and finally, I think we're talking about this is. You know, the sustainability conversation has been about uh, operational carbon, has been about how the performance of the building can be uh, as uh, less bad as possible. But the embodied carbon conversation is really, um, I think, the one that we finally are having and need to have more aggressively, um, which is, you know, what is what is the cost of the extraction of these materials and the use of these materials in their cost on the environment just to get them to site. What is the cost of uh, not designing to the climate around us being reliant on uh, mechanical systems uh, in order for the buildings to breathe? Those fundamental questions, which are, you know, are not luxuries that every building has around the world, but certainly uh, we, and we expect in the United States, I think we have a lot to learn from uh, the way in which we can build to, uh, around the world with, materials that are local with uh, climates that are microclimates that they're designed towards and, and with um, the kind of intelligence of the, of a functioning living building uh, has been lost when we're really designing the, uh, the mechanical system, a building around a mechanical system instead of the inverse building, you know, designing a building for its specific climate. So I think, yes, that is a shift we will see. I hope we will see uh, buildings that are very actively, uh, not just passively uh, working, but actively breathing um, in their climate uh, that are uh, living and, and seen to live with the kind of use of them. And then also when they finish their useful life, they are decommissioned or deconstructed in, in productive and uh, sustainable ways as well. Right, right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, hospitals uh, and uh you talked about how you know trauma centers and emergency rooms have changed to respond to the gun violence in our country. Uh, what is your sense of uh, the medical here in the in the in, in the U- North America, let's say United States, its preparation, in its its architectural design preparation for dealing with uh, epidemics. I know we have piped oxygen, but what about sort of design systems of the kinds that you are interested in? Well, you know, I say this with so much respect for this, this ho- the hospital systems and what they're coping with, but I think, you know, I think one thing should be really clear to all of us that the hospitals in our country are not designed to meet epidemic surge like we're seeing right. today. They're not mm-hmm. designed for that. Mm-hmm. And and that might come as a surprise to the public, but I think as soon as you peel back the layer, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, they're designed with their financial models are very tight. You know, they have tight margins. They're they're designed to fill beds. They're designed to, uh, you know, get large specialty services and high reimbursables. And you know, the 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 public health component of them for incredible acute care. You know, there, there are just certain parts of each hospital that are designed to to manage really challenging contagious diseases. So those isolation rooms with negative pressure, you know, there might be one or two on a floor where mm-hmm. uh, we worked with Mount Sinai uh, over the course of the last three weeks to help them and also to study what they were doing as they were actively redesigning their hospital in the middle of the surge in New York City. I mean, it was absolutely amazing. 
to wow. watch how clinicians and uh, you know the executives of the hospital and the facilities people were just you know butting up against their you know their inherited infrastructure to try to accommodate to as best they knew the infection control guidelines that you know were actively being written are actively being written to manage covid and uh-huh. do the best they could to protect healthcare workers but i think if you wanted one measurement that should really shock us and really i think reveal how unprepared our the built infrastructure of hospitals was to manage this disease is is looking at how sick health health workers are, are getting you know 20 percent are getting infected right 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 that yeah. number is a, a, like staggering and and what it really suggests is that the physical space in which they're working in is not able to be decontaminated fast enough to cope with the kind of patients that are coming in mm-hmm. uh, it's in and and we have to really take that seriously and think about that both as architects, but also as active, you know, systems designers is, you know, what are the quick and dirty things that we can kind of repurpose and reconfigure right now to protect health workers um, who are in the middle of it on the front lines. And then what does that mean for these buildings, you know, after, after these surges and how, how do they continue to, you know, protect the public as they come in there, the, the variables that they can't control. Right. And it's fascinating to watch. Uh, and also I think really pushes us as a design community to say, Hey, look, these, these are not fixed systems. These are like living systems that are changing and they have to accommodate extreme surge uh, as well as uh, you know, the, the inverse of that, a kind of daily, the daily quotidian life of a normal a sort of normal public health scenarios. They have to manage both of those things, and we're only prepared for the latter, not the not the former. Yeah, so they have to be transformable and adaptable, and switch on a dime to accommodate these kind of situations. Uh, uh, yeah, with... I think that's right. Yeah, and I, you know, I think that we, we we often in architecture might talk about like utmost flexibility as the strategy and. You know, hospital design in the mid-century dealt a lot with flexibility, um, but I but I also think sometimes flexibility we, we kind of some 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 of these things have to be really inflexible uh, um, actually, uh, which is like mm-hmm. the isolation room has to have not just piped oxygen, it has to have negative pressure, you know, for, forced air outside, it has to have an ante room uh, for donning and doffing. You know, that's a very fixed infrastructure, right? Um, and uh, that actually is hard to change. Uh, it's, a, it's a question of can you plug those really kind of rigid systems into a more flexible uh, superstructure or a more flexible um, uh, cartilage, <laughs> if you want to use that word, you know, um, uh-huh. that, can, that can be adapted for surge. Um, and, and I go back to the trauma hospitals. I think they do have figured out a way to do that, you know, converting parking garages into triage centers, for example, you know, looking at the ambulance bays as, as areas uh, that are uh, isolated from the uh, other, uh, a- other ambulance bays that might have normal treatment uh, so that they kind of control the, the chaos and the trauma. There's a lot of policies in place that, that might give us some insight into towards a, a pandemic resilient health infrastructure of the future. Uh, so I think there's a lot of learnings there. Mm, fantastic. Uh, let's, uh, let's uh, travel abroad. Uh, are you engaged uh, with uh, Dr. Farmer or otherwise uh, in the in, in, uh, COVID preparation, preparedness or, or, or clinics uh, in uh, abroad, sub-Saharan Africa or elsewhere? Yeah, we've been, you know, our work began in Rwanda with, with Partners in Health and, and continues today. Uh, we have um, over 80 people working uh, in East Africa and some in West Africa. And at the moment are building seven different projects in, in a number of different countries. Um, and you know, all of that stuff went on hold, uh, especially the work in Rwanda where our, our base is. We have six projects under construction there. And, mm-hmm. you know, those all had to pause um, uh, during during this uh, the spike. And, you know, Rwanda's managed COVID in a really aggressive way. I mean, they shut down their borders. They stopped all air travel. I mean, they've really intensely tried to manage it as a small country, uh, you know, with limited resources, but, a, you know, a strong... A strong successfully? government successfully 
Well, you know, they are managing it from what I understand. You know, we get daily updates. Um, they've been contract tracing. They've been really reducing, if not stopping, almost all travel outside, inside and outside the borders. And they've been very aggressive about uh, social distancing and, um, and self-isolation. That being said, uh, you know, essential projects like some of the projects that we're working on will start up again, we believe, um, in particular because we're building two hospitals, one for the capital um, that's, you know, two months away from construction completion. So this itself would add almost 200 beds to, uh, to the capital uh, and be essential, obviously, for this and, and future surges. Uh, the other hospital we're building is in the south of the country and also essential in the kind of broader landscape of that health infrastructure. The projects that we're building in Liberia, though, I think are of, of interest because they, those came after, might be of interest because those came after Ebola outbreak, the kind of last epidemic right. that we were immersed in. And, and there were a lot of lessons, I think, from that, uh, from the outbreak of Ebola and how the government of Liberia and Sierra Leone really mobilized to both manage the immediate needs of the outbreak, but also invest in long-term infrastructure that their country needed to stave off the next, you know, surge or the next epidemic. And, um, you know, what Ellen Johnson Sirleaf and and others have really fought fought for during the height of the outbreak uh, are are still, you know, are still paying dividends now. And uh, our hospital, the Redemption Hospital, uh, would be the kind of central hospital of Monrovia uh, is, is under construction and, um, you know, is going to, is continuing through the outbreak because of the essential need of this infrastructure uh, to manage it uh, when the surge really hits, uh, hits the African continent, sub-Saharan Africa. What are the core design principles that you adopt in hospitals and medical facilities, uh, particularly in Africa, or elsewhere uh, that you think are are preparatory for epidemics. Well, th- you know, there's there's a couple of things. I mean, each epidemic teaches us something else about our infection control protocols and whether they're uh, appropriate or have to be amended. Um, what I think TB taught us in Rwanda uh, is that. Uh, airflow matters significantly, one, and 12 air changes per hour can be achieved without mecha- large mechanical ventilation systems. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that conclusion, uh, you know, while maybe obvious and simple, is, can also, is also kind of radical when we think about U.S. healthcare facilities that right now are, are completely reliant on mechanical systems. Right, 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 right. Uh, You know, in fact, you know, without significant code improvement, it's not possible to build natural ventilation into healthcare buildings in the United States. And some of that is starting to change. But, uh, you know, that was a radical idea. And I think a lot of learnings came from that, um, that I think are applicable now. And one of those is that we need resilient and redundant systems, you know, so we can't fully anticipate the types of outbreaks we might have. And so, uh, the more redundant systems we have, if there's mechanical systems, but you also have windows that can open, for example, um, uh, it allows us some flexibility. Uh, and we saw that at Mount Sinai, actually, where uh, the 1920 bed towers are the ones that had windows that could open, but the new bed towers didn't have windows that could open. So they were huh. putting, putting the isolation rooms in the old bed towers because they needed to vent out uh, HEPA filters and uh, into the windows that could open. You know, the idea right. that hospitals today are built without operable windows is a kind of a, an amazing and challenging thought. We should think about that. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. You know, the second thing is, I think, I think the second big lesson that I, I, I find that applies almost to everything we do, uh, you know, I don't want to say it this in an aggressive way, but like hallways are kind of the enemy, you know. <laughs> we like... You know, and this maybe many architects have said this before. Maybe Herman Hertzberger said it very directly. But like, how do we design? Oh, yeah. How do we design hallways out of our architecture? Um, and there's something really, you know, this is relevant from like the Pruitt Igo, uh, you know, in St. Louis to 
uh, to, to the medical facilities we see today. I mean, hallways are that in-between space that we like to think lots of interactions happen, but actually what happens is a lot of undefined and uh, undesigned uh, experiences that we are hard to control. Uh, and in a hospital setting, what happens uh, is a lot of patients end up waiting in the hallway. There's really bad ventilation. Um, there's a lot of density and a content, you know, potential contamination. There's a lot, it's a much riskier space. It's harder to control uh, in mm -hmm. terms of contagion. And so the more that we can keep people out of hallways and design away from hallways, the better. So, you know, in the climates of like, you know, central East Africa, we have the ability to have outside hallways. And, you know, that's something that we, we certainly want to take advantage of. So those, those are kind of two lessons. And I think the third is then being really uh, clear about the separation of being able to isolate and separate those that are most contagious from those that are the general public, you know, really being able to differentiate between uh, illness and wellness. And th that's happening. You're seeing that now in the, our medical spaces. Like if you are going for a wellness visit, they're completely moving you now out of the central medical facility into uh, spaces where they're only dealing with patients that have no symptoms. Right. Uh, and that kind of clear separation is, I think, something that we're experiencing as well. Right. You start off uh, many of your presentations, for instance, your TED Talk, with, uh, you know, a sort of a implicit or explicit critique of architectural education and perhaps its values. Is that how it's, is that how it's read? Oh. <laughs> well, well, I'm in the education business, so maybe that's how I read it. <laughs> Uh, but uh, but I am interested in your thoughts on uh, on uh, you know looking ahead. If uh, you know you've talked about uh, taking advantage of uh, pressing the kind of cases that we have in, in 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 a sense been making about the necessity of good public space uh, of uh, passive design and so on, and pressing them into the public realm and making our case. Uh, uh, what are the kinds of things, how, how, what are your thoughts on architectural, what, what were the sort of things you'd like to see happening better in architectural education after, after the present crisis? Yeah, I mean, I want to you know, state for the record that I you know, have great, um, great respect for the architectural education, both the pedagogy as well as uh, the, the process of, of how we think about the built environment in its myriad of different ways. And mm -hmm. the kind of this, what is so exciting and, and challenging about the education of architects is how we straddle both the science of buildings as well as the, 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 hu the humanism of the art form. And that the one without the other, you know, does, is impossible. You know, we need, we need both of them. We need kind of the practical, the pragmatic, as well as the aspirational and the, and the optimistic and the utopian, these things all together um, form, I think, our built world around us. And uh, like only in the school do we get access to all of that complexity and nuance and challenge. And I would also say real work ethic, you know, a kind of commitment to fighting and pushing and pushing yourself and challenging yourself. And all those things are embedded within the, the pedagogy of architecture, which I, I think are really essential and important and and have also, you know, given me, you know, given me the, the hope that I have that we can do something. And, you know, my, my implicit critique is not so much that we failed as educators, but that our discipline has to some degree failed um, to be ready for the kind of the, the crises around us. And the, and we have at some level been forced into a corner, but also I think given away agency that we, I think, hold as the fiduciary uh, stewards of, of, a, of a public good. And it is a, a real value that we provide to the public. And we should be advancing that, advocating for it, um, telling the stories about how the, built, how the built environment around us can improve our lives, but also can injure us. Um, there, there's just a real uh, essential service and essential human right that we provide. And I, I think mm -hmm. we have more to do in the academy to make that relevance more forward in, in, in the minds of, of the professions, the professionals that we're training. And, mm -hmm. you know, I think 
that's that's an opportunity I think we we can see and 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 I think we're at that moment right now an existential moment you know what happens when the what happened in 2008 with the financial collapse is when when I was f- coming through school is the same thing that students are going to be dealing with now which is the complete collapse of the architectural business model I mean we are going to see probably you know a, a hemorrhaging of staff we're seeing some of that already uh, right projects drying up all over the place infrastructure and and architecture really becoming the in, you know an industry of thriving economy not an industry of struggling economic situations and so architects are kind of the first to go they're like the canary in the coal mine to the <laughs> for like <laughs> economic right. collapse yeah yeah and i think that should also wake us up to a, a question of not just why we practice but how we practice yeah and um how we practice as a as a discipline is it's not just about garnering a commission it's about providing this crucial service to the public and so right. should we be paid a percentage of construction costs or should we be paid by providing that because we provide that service to the public is yeah. there a way that we could reconfigure the way that we practice our business models so that we're insulated from the uh the kind of whims of the market uh as it kind of thrashes us around as a discipline could we be insulated by that by working for things that are outside of the market or work before a market emerges? Um, these are the kind of questions that we've been asking and, and to some degree because we've been forced to ask them by working in settings that were really you know, not markets for architects when we started working in them. And we set up our firm as a nonprofit organization. And what that really means is that we are a mix of philanthropy and grants as well as revenue. You know, We still charge service fees Mm-hmm. But we are able to garner grants and philanthropy in order to do the work necessary that would that can't pay for design yet or is before the market in order to catalyze and incubate design work way upstream uh, and make the case for why architecture is valuable in like a community or uh, for a certain nonprofit organization or uh, just in rethinking uh, the space around us. And what that has left us with is a certain insulation from the market cha- challenges we're facing now, N- not fully insulated, but some insulation um, that's going to keep us, I think, working through this crisis. Um, no, you, you, you've you become, uh, you should be experiencing a boom, one would imagine, like Amazon is, like suddenly this becomes a critical service. Uh, so what, what, what I would love, want to take this to is, you know, you put in very critical terms there, you know, giving away agency. I mean, it seems to me that some of this giving away of agency occurred when we sloughed off urban design and planning and other disciplines from mm-hmm. architecture. Mm-hmm. When it, I, th- I think uh, for all its ills in the 50s and 60s, when in, in a more sort of a modernist time, uh the public good uh, was more centrally the business of the architect, mm-hmm. was it not? I mean, I mean, it seems to me perhaps we have to rethink this this sloughing off into disciplines. Uh, yeah, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. I mean, there is you know modernism had, a, had an incredible social project. Uh, of course, yeah. we see uh, the public good in the era of, of sanitation, the sanitation era in the 1870s and 80s, you know, where, which also when it began, yeah, it began and was all about how does architecture improve the lives of the public? Um, everything from, you know, William Morris to, to Frederick Law Olmsted to Florence Nightingale, who not an architect also may have had the most uh, impact on the hospital infrastructure of the 19th century. You know, in, in these, uh, you know, look at Isambard Brunel, you know, architect, engineer, designer, bridge builder, tunnel builder. I mean, this guy was so amazing and he changed the way that the built infrastructure around us was performing, but also accountable. And, you know, there's so many lessons of the history of our discipline that, that say that these things are intertwined, that the profession of architecture and the public service and our health are all interrelated and they can't be separated. We only really there's always there has always been a strand that's tried to separate them, 
Um, I don't want to name names, but I, we could talk about who they are. But there has, was a significant disciplinary shift in the late 70s where theory really embraced the idea that separation was, a, was, was necessary and, um, and to some degree fetishized that separation, to theorize it, talk about it, and, and create a kind of disciplinary hemorrhage where we could pretend like architecture could be simply discussed only out, outside of all of its other social and political conditions. Right. And I think that moment was, was a really dangerous experiment. Uh, dangerous might be a little extreme word, but has had long-term downstream effects, not only, in, not yeah. only in polarizing who we serve, i.e. that architects are really in service of the elite and the rich that can pay for them only, mm -hmm. And it's a kind of boutique product uh, in mm -hmm. which we show off a certain status, um, but also kind of cleaving off all of the d disciplinary knowledge, intelligence, work, and advocacy for the public good as not real architecture. Right. <laughs> and that the idea, yeah, that there is a separation between like real architecture and not real architecture that we still struggle with in school today. Uh, I think is a is something that has to end uh, because that theoretical project has been confusing our discipline. I think for forty years, and thank gosh, uh, you know, thank thankfully, I should say, that's starting to change as a demand from the students, but also as a demand from faculty that we prove, you know, prove our relevance and value and service about what we understand architecture to be and what its value is in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I, yeah, completely. So thank you for that. Uh, as we move towards the end here, I just wanted to sort of switch scales a little bit. You've mentioned uh, uh, how certain materials are, of course, better than others and, you know, how cottons and, 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 and wood is much better than steel and plastics we are finding with respect to this particular virus and and you also mentioned uh, that the various scales at which uh, prevention works, and one of them, of course, is the personal. Uh, and we, you mentioned, and uh, we all know about face masks now, which are you know kicking in. I mean, it seems to me from the one side, it's the public realm and the city and and and, and everything else that is also uh, a topic for architecture. But also at the other end of the scale, you know, clothing and if you want, fashion is. Uh, is also a topic of architecture. I mean, it, architecture begins the uh, moment uh, we are dealing with space right outside the body. Is it does it, does it not? Mm. Yeah, I think that's a. It's a. I, I didn't think about it that way, but you're right. The face mask is a kind of spatial. <laughs> is a sort of uh, it's a mini architecture, isn't it? Mini, yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a hint or a, a tell uh, that the space around us is something that's jeopardizing us. You know, I. I I think, well, yes, I agree with you. Uh, architecture is everywhere and there is architecture in everything. Um, but I, I, also, I also want, for the purpose of having the same debate and also building a kind of spatial vocabulary with the public, which is, I think, something else we need to do in the academy, um, is, is, is help differentiate which scale we're talking about. Use the word scale. I think that's the right word. Mm -hmm. And... You know, there is the, I go back to these, maybe these four scales and, and we could introduce more, um, but there's the scale of the body, you know, mm -hmm. the, the face mask, the, the, the room, uh, there's the scale of the, of the neighborhood, which is about, you know, maybe the planting of trees or the management of streets, uh, the, the zoning of buildings, heights, and, you know, access to, you know, water. Uh, there's the scale of, uh, you could say the scale of the city and the scale of the nation. And then there's the scale of the planet. Right. And there's, you know, and, and obviously decisions I make about a building, one building, affects many of those scales all at the same time. If I choose, you know, to import steel from China and certain pl plastics or polycarbonates, or if I, uh, you know, who, who we're serving in what community and how it affects the buildings around it, all of those decisions are are. <clears throat> there's a heterodoxy about how they all interconnect. And I think one of the challenges we have uh, is we have to clarify which scale we're talking about to be very specific about 
each one and then try to address each one so that we don't forget the other ones. Um, and a building obviously in, in inter is interspersed with all of those scales and it's challenging uh, to get the public to speak on all of those skills. We can only speak sometimes on whether I like it or not like it. Well, that's not effective critic, critical right, engagement. Right. Oh, I like the way it looks. I don't like the way it looks. It's not, that's, you know, that maybe is one scale of discussion, but there's this entire other scale about the materiality, about the labor that was used, about its performance, about its functionality, and about its beauty and dignity. Uh, it's about its planetary impact. And once we build, I think, a, a richer spatial vocabulary with the public, you know, that, that's also part of recreating this agency um, and rebuilding that trust is we can have that discussion uh, on multiple scales. And that would increase our dialogue about how buildings affect us. It would increase the value that we assign to certain buildings. It would, it would change business models if we could do so because you'd be applying value uh, and financial value to certain, you know, certain thresholds of those uh, meeting of those scales. Uh, and we'd be more integrated as that public servant that we really are uh, into the daily life of the community. Mm -hmm. Well, here's hoping we we'll can, some new ways will emerge for us to better integrate into the public life of the community and the city and, and the countryside and the nation and the planet, really. Mm -hmm. Michael, thanks for taking the time. I really enjoyed this conversation. I did too. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to Architecture Talk. This is your producer, Amelia Jarvanen. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. And if you did, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes or Spotify. We would also love to hear from you if you have any suggestions on new topics or guests. You can always reach out to us on our website, Facebook, or Instagram. Thank you again, and until next time, this is Architecture Talk.